Today's scripture reading is Ruth 2, verses 7 through 9 and 14 through 23. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Ruth 14 through 23. And at, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some of the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an epitaph of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law uh, saw what she had gleaned. She also uh, brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I worked today is Boaz. And, no no and Naomi, <laughs> Naomi sorry, said to her daughter-in-law, uh, may, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of your redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, sorry, said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of your redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley, and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of God. I don't usually get nervous um, when I preach, but today I'm more than nervous. Um, today's subject matter is difficult and painful, and it is definitely not for children. This is an adult subject matter. We're going to talk about this the subject of sexual assault. And um, some of you are wondering, why are we talking about this? Um, one is because it's in the Bible. It's in this passage that we've been going through in Ruth chapter 2. And um, it'd be tempting to just skip the things that are really difficult and painful and um, hard to talk about, but that wouldn't be teaching you the Bible. The Bible is above us. It is wiser than us. It is from God. We ought not to duck the things that we just don't want to think about. And indeed, those are actually maybe the things we very much need to think about. This is also a subject about, about justice. This book is very much about justice, especially for the categories I've, been, I've taught you that the Bible emphasizes, the fatherless, the widow, and those who I've called the... the the translators called it sojourners, but I'd like to say of those who are vulnerable minorities. And I would say it would be extremely um, irresponsible to not hit the subject when we're talking about the subject of justice, especially for those kinds of people. Now, I've been praying for weeks. Um, I've really been trembling, quite frankly, to give this message. And I'm not afraid to teach you, as you know, for those of you, who uh, have been um, pastored by me to speak forthrightly what is in the Bible. 
But I especially have been praying that the Lord would use me in such a way that anyone who hears this, who may have experienced something really bad in their life, would feel that this is a loving message. That they would feel love and kindness and mercy, certainly from me and from our church, and most importantly from the Lord. Okay? So with that said, let's get into today's message. Part one. The dangers to women in Canaanite culture. The dangers to women in Canaanite culture. Part two, contending with modern day Canaan. Canaan is an ancient land. Well, the problems of Canaan are very, very modern and contemporary. So this is a very, very relevant word, which I hope you'll see. And part three, the cleansing blood of the Lamb of God. And if you are new to Christianity, the Lamb of God is Jesus. Okay? Let's go to part one. The dangers to women in Canaanite culture. Let's get right into it. Let's get to the first slide, verse 8. Now, I can't go too much into the background story. If you're new here today and you don't know much about the Bible, the book of Ruth is about um, uh, the, the, the central character is a woman named Ruth, and she's not an Israelite. She is a foreigner. And she is a widow. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, is an Israelite. She also is a widow. And Naomi and her husband moved to Moab. And then her husband died. And then her two sons died. And thus, one of her daughter-in-laws came back with her, Ruth. She's desperately poor. And she's doing this thing called gleaning, which is to go through the fields and pick up food that has not been picked up, which is a command by God specifically for the poor. So that's the situation we're in. And there's this very, and this subject matter that we're going to touch on today comes up. So let's get into it. Verse 8. Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. It's interesting, all right? It's kind. Um, I've already said to you that he's, he's kind of protecting her because, you know, the Israelites hate the Moabites and vice versa. There's deep racism and hatred between these two tribes. So, at the very least, she'll be physically safe. If she goes over there, something bad could happen to her through physical violence. She may get very rude racist remarks. But then he goes on to say this, verse 9. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. That is, you know, like uh, keep close to my young women. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? So he's Israelite. It's very, very serious in the Bible. Um, sexual assault is taken very, very seriously in the Bible. I, I just want, just for the sake of time, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, if a woman is assaulted and is out in the field where nobody can hear her cry out, and then it comes back, the, the man who raped her, you know what happens to him? He dies. <laughs> it's a capital punishment. So, it's very, very serious. He's an Israelite. And yet, every man that works for him who's also an Israelite, they should know, well, nothing bad's going to happen to her because we're good Israelites, right? But just I want to just tell you, there's an indicator here that they're supposed to be righteous Israelites but he himself, he himself made sure that there isn't a dirty one among his men. He says, I told them, don't, they're not going to touch you. So he makes it very, very clear. And he goes on, when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. I just want to say, just a quick, I haven't said too much about this, but um, in this culture, generally the women draw the water and the men you know, they have to do certain kinds of work, and then they get to drink the, um, the, uh, the water from the women. Here, this is incredible. What he does is says, you get to drink like the men. It's a really important piece of social signal. He's telling everybody, this is how she's going to be treated. Don't you dare treat her in any less way. He's, he's actually elevating her status inside of, of, their, of their social circle. And he's making sure, he's telling her very explicitly, you're safe here. And if it's not clear to you that it's about sexual assault, it will become very clear, okay? 
Let's jump ahead to verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. So it's probably men and women. There are some women who do certain jobs, and men do certain jobs. This is extremely unusual because generally, actually, um, Israelites are commanded not to eat, to eat with those who are not Israelites because they're actually ritually unclean. But at the same time, there's another command, which is to provide for them. <laughs> and here he is signaling to everybody, she belongs with us. The reason, one of the reasons why God commands that um, these, these three classes of people, the fatherless, the widow, and then the minorities, the outsider, they do not have belonging. There's nobody who watches after them. This is just the case throughout all the world. In every culture, in every time and place, if they're not one of you, nobody cares. You know, if you go throughout our city, the people who are in certain industries, um, I, I, I think about, I forget, a number of years ago, I was listening to a podcast, and it was talking about strippers. You know who ends up being a stripper? Somebody who comes from a fatherless, a widow, and often of certain ethnicities. Nobody else cared for them, so they fall through the cracks of society, and then they become exploited and oppressed. And they usually end up diseased and beaten and live a short life. So God demands from his people, you will watch after these people. And you know what's normal? Even though God demands it, it makes a very, very serious threat to Israel. If you don't do this, I will, my wrath will come down on you. You know what? Israelites still don't generally do this. But here is a man whom the, at the beginning of this chapter, he's called a worthy man, as I took a lot of time to tell you. And worthy means that he is a covenant keeper. He's a justice doer. And here you can see it. She's going to be in the, in the company of, the, of, of those who belong. And you know what that's going to do? It doesn't just mean it's nice. She gets to eat. It doesn't mean we're just going to be nice to her. It signals to everybody when you see her on the street, when you see her in the field, when you see her in our community, she's one of us. <laughs> don't you dare just let her be, hang out there. If you see some dirty man out there talking or interacting with her in some kind of like gross and, and worthless manner, you better speak up. So this entrance at sitting at the dinner table, it's tremendously important. So she sat by the reapers, and he passed by her roasted grain. Let's go to verse 15. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the shields, sheaves, and do not reproach her. And I want to, and I've said this, I already gave some attention to this, and here's something I want to say, I'm just kind of waiting for this message to say, which is, do not reproach her means do not look down on her. Do not insult her. Do not talk about her like she's some kind of sexual object. Don't do that. <laughs> you will treat her with decency and honor as if she belongs to us, as she's your sister, as she's among our people. So that's a really important thing. And then he goes on to say, make sure she gets some of the good food. Don't rebuke her for picking up the food. Which is another way of saying, don't look down on a person because she's desperately poor. <laughs> and so, in all these different ways, our culture tends to only tend to think about um, those who are poor in an economic sense. But those who are poor often lack belonging, and thus they lack all kinds of other protections too. And in so many ways, this is actually even more important. The reason so many people are out in our streets or desperate in our society today is because they just don't have anybody else. They don't have enough relationships. So nobody's there to watch after their back. And certainly, certain people, it's going to end it very, very dangerously for them. Okay? Let's jump ahead to verse 21. Ruth the Moabite, see the emphasis there? Said, besides, he said to me, so she goes back to her mother-in-law, she's got a ton of food, 
And her mother was like, whoa, where did you get this? This is incredible. And besides, he said, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And then this is what Naomi says to Ruth, her daughter-in-law. It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So right there in the text, Boaz says it in a nice way. And so if you're going, is he really talking about that, Pastor? The Bible makes it explicit. From her mother-in-law, she says, he's watching after you to make sure nobody touches you in a really, really bad way. Now some of you are thinking, okay, Pastor, it's in the Bible. I see it. And there's like a couple instances there, and you showed some other things. But really, is that really there? And I want to show you, um, I want to talk, tell you about how to interpret this passage, okay? I told you at the beginning that there's a lot of things to learn from the book of Ruth. One of the things I'm going to teach you in the book of Ruth is just how to read the Bible, especially how to read the Old Testament. So I'm going to take you to this verse. This is the way the book opens. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah, and then the story opens. So, if you don't know your Bible, this is the way it, it this is the order, in the, and it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books of the Bible, and they're typically called the books of Moses. Then it's Joshua, Judges, then this book, Ruth. So Judges is the period that this occurs in, and after this, there will be the rise of the kingship in the nation of Israel. And before that, they had no kings. What God would do is he would, he would specially bless certain leaders. And, um, and then they were a tribe. They weren't even like a, a very unified nation, but they were a tribe of 12 tribes, 12 kind of like clans. And um, this, this is happening during this period. Now, let me also tell you a little something about the book of Judges. It's a hard book to read. Because what happens in the book of, of Judges is um, the people regularly, when they don't have a good leader, they fall away into idolatry and wickedness. And what is some of that wickedness? The wickedness is how they end up treating certain people in, the, in their midst. And it shows up in some pretty bad stories in the book of Judges. And toward the latter portion of the book of Judges, there is a horrible account in Judges 19. Let's go to our next slide. So, I spared you the horror of reading this text aloud, so I'm just going to kind of summarize what is happening. So, Judges, the historians don't exactly know if the Ruth period is the period of Judges 19. But you know what? It's a pretty good guess. <laughs> if you have a righteous man, a worthy man, as chapter 2, verse 1 calls, Boaz, and this is how he acts toward the Israelite guys. He knows over there in Moab, yeah, bad things happen to women, bad things happen to children, even like maybe even boys and, 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 and little girls too. But over here, we're supposed to be a, a better kind of people, but here he is telling his own guys, don't touch her. <laughs> That's a pretty good indicator that in his time, Israel is far from a righteous and just society, and that the Canaanite ways, the unjust, wicked, and dangerous ways that Canaanites treat some of the people is not unheard of, even in his circle. So let me give you an example of this. It's one of the most horrible stories in the Bible. In Judges chapter 19, it's a story about a Levite. Now, a Levite is like a priest. So today, roughly, he's like a pastor, okay? And a Levite takes on a concubine, and a concubine is not a wife. It's like a woman you take on to be sort of like a wife. They actually call him a wife, but she may be more like a second-class person in your house, and you basically like to have sex with her. <laughs> so we have this Levite who today is like, we would say is like a modern-day pastor. He has a concubine. And then they go through Israel, like we're talking the core portions of Israel, they actually pass by Jerusalem, because at that time it's a wicked city, and they get to this area called Gibeah, uh, which is in the area of the, the tribe of Benjamin, and what, hap what happens is a gang of, and this is very interesting, 
I, t I spent lots of time in the last two weeks to tell you how important it is that Boaz is called a worthy man. <laughs> well, a bunch of guys gather outside of where, where this Levite and his concubine is spending the night as they're traveling to go back home, and a bunch of worthless fellows, worthless, it's exactly the same word, ha'il, those without ha'il, worthless fellows gather outside, and basically the guy who is like hosting them has a daughter, and um, he has this, you know, you have the, the Levite and his concubine, and these worthless men come out and basically knock on the door and tell the owner of the house, um, we want to rape that guy. <laughs> and he goes, don't do that. This is what the owner says. Don't do that. I have a daughter. And he has a concubine. <laughs> Why don't you do what you want with them? That's the story. The Israelite guy, that's what he says. If you read that in the story, there's another place in the Bible where a very similar thing happens, and that happens in Sodom, in the book of Genesis. And um, God hated that city. He hated that city so much, he burned that city down from the, like, from the sky. Boom, just destroyed it. And so, in this period of Judges, this is what it's like. And... Um, in fact, the story actually gets worse. Uh, they send out the concubine. And she basically gets gang raped all night long by these worthless fellows. And when the Levite wakes up in the morning, she is like, it's actually very, it's a little ambiguous. whether she's. He tells her to get up, but then she can't get up. It's ambiguous whether she's already dead or whether he murders her. So then what the Levite does, and you know, <laughs> what he does is he cuts up her body into 12 pieces. And he sends off those body parts to all the different tribes of Israel because that's how mad he is. He thinks he's being righteous. And what it does is it sets off a civil war. And tons of people die. So when you're reading Ruth chapter 2, and it says, and she says, definitely you should do that, otherwise you could get assaulted over there. You, you know, you're, when you read Ruth chapter 2, if you just go back a few more chapters to Judges chapter 19, Judges chapter 19 is just a few chapters ahead, this should be on your mind. <laughs> Judges 19 and Ruth 2, the commentaries on each other. This is what the time and place is like. And so when I say that there's danger in Canaanite culture, even if it's supposed to be Israelite culture, it's very, very serious business in the Bible. Now, um, I want to say a couple more things before I move to part two. One is, how is Boaz and Naomi acting here? You know what they're doing? They know the covenant. They know what God's standards of justice are. They are covenant keepers. Boaz is a covenant keeper. He's a justice doer. It's utterly in contrast to the culture. And I want to share with you just one other person. If you, don't, you may not even have grown up in the church, but you probably know that Jesus ate, had dinner with prostitutes. And in the modern 21st century, people say, oh, Jesus is such a kind, loving person. He even eats dinner with prostitutes. And of course, he is tremendously, beautifully, tenderly kind to women that are thrown away by society, abused, exploited, oppressed. But it's not just simply that he is supremely loving and kind. It's that he's a justice keeper. Do you see it? He himself is God. <laughs> he is Yahweh. He gives us command. He knows that prostitutes... Yes, they're living in a lifestyle that God deeply disapproves of and the whole culture disapproves of. Even today we disapprove of prostitutes, although there's sometimes a fight about it. Some people today think, well, that's a good argument. You know, we should just legalize that profession. But what woman wants to do that? <laughs> there is no woman 
when she's like five or 10 or 50, goes, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life. They all end up like this because they are among the fatherless, the widows. Nobody cares for them among the minorities. But when Jesus sits at that table, when Boaz is feeding this woman, can you see Jesus there too? <laughs> the ultimate worthy man, Jesus, is showing he's a lot like this worthy man, Boaz, the covenant keeper, the justice maker. Let's go to part two. Contending with modern day Canaan. And I want to... You know, today, I know sometimes you, people read the Bible and they're like, this is a really old book, and is this stuff relevant today? Canaan, I, I, I take the time to let you know what that culture is like, because for all of history, God's people will be like Israel, but they're going to be living in somebody else's culture, in a non-godly culture. Do you know the story of what it means to be Christian? So if you're I have friends who are Indian. We have members in our church who are Indian. They tell me that if you're a Christian in India, pretty much everybody else thinks you're stupid <laughs> because there's such a small minority of a majority Hindu and Muslim society that they basically are living in Canaan. You get it? India is Canaan. 2% <laughs> of the population there is Israel. Well, that's how it is today too. But you know, so far, it's a really good thing that Western societies have had a very serious attitude about how, um, how, how vulnerable people need to be protected and how certain criminals um, we, really, we really need to make sure that they face justice. But I want to um, take you to a quote of, a, of a, a woman, a thinker who's rising that I really admire. She's actually, I think, in her 30s. She's, she's a, a, at least a generation younger than me. And she wrote this really brilliant book that I wrote, uh, that I read. It was called the, the Case, I think it's called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. She's not a Christian. She's not a Christian. She's a brilliant, young, British intellectual. And though she's not a Christian, she thinks, hey, we need to get rid of this sexual revolution. It's really bad for women. And I love this book. She gave a very profound secular case against, secu um, against the sexual revolution. I commend that book to you. But I want to give you a quote from an essay that she wrote, which I love too. And it was called, We Are Repaganizing. Okay? So here's what she says. Louise Perry. Uh, it's Louise. I misspelled her name, darn it. <laughs> Louise Perry, okay? The violation of slaves and other low-born people was simply, Harper, she's, she's citing a historian, puts it, beyond the vision for ancient thinkers. All legal systems, including the Roman one, have some concept of rape as forbidden sexual violation. But rape is normally a crime that can be committed against only some categories of women. You hear that? So we have this crime called rape, but not in all times and all places do we think that if a certain violation happens, that's rape. It can only happen to certain women. That's what she's saying. Typically, only those whose male kin are inclined to object to the offense and able to punish the perpetrator. So here's what it means. If a woman has belonging and she gets violated and she has a brother or a father or a cousin or uncles or just her clan, those guys will rise up and go get that other guy and probably kill him. <laughs> or at the very least, there'll be a very, very serious problem. And just because people know she belongs to these people, you know what that does? It keeps, it's, it's not because people are righteous. What it is is the threat of the violence and of the repercussion kind of keeps the order. <laughs> but if someone doesn't have belonging, if someone doesn't have belonging, nobody cares. It happens today too. 
Um, I think it happens today too. You know, you have uh, regular court cases and there's a charge of rape. And do you know, this is how it works. The prosecution, because they're supposed to defend, I mean, the, the defendant, the defense attorney, because they're supposed to do their best to defend the accused, will then attack the credibility of the woman who's claiming she's raped. And do you know that if she's like a prostitute, or if she's kind of known to be a sexually loose woman, a lot of the attorneys don't even want to take the case. They don't even want to take the case. Because nobody cares about her. And so, in our society, America, 21st century, I don't know if you know this, but poor women who don't have belonging regularly will not get justice. So what Louise Perry is saying is utterly true in the ancient world, but it's true all around the world. So what she says is the poor and the friendless have no such recourse. Nobody's going to help them. Nobody's going to fight for them. And they are thus defined as unrapeable. My wife uh, saw this quote and she's like, she got a little confused. She's like, oh, of course they can be raped, but nobody will think of it as rape. That's what's going on here in Ruth chapter 2. Next slide. The moral, the moral innovation of Christianity was to reconceptualize rape as a moral wrong done to the woman herself, regardless of her birth, regardless of whose family she is, what ethnicity she is, what socioeconomic level she is, it is a horrible violation, period. Why? Because Christians believe all people are made in the image of God. It's a violation against God. It's absolutely an offense against God, which is why in Deuteronomy 22, there's death penalty for it. <laughs> Paul's prohibition of, to use the Greek term, porneia, so you guys want to know where the word pornography comes from. It comes from a, a general terminology of sexual wickedness. It's like it covers all things. Okay. Porneia, that is illicit sexual activity, including prostitution, upended an ethical system in which male access to the female body was unquestioned and unquestionable. So here is uh, one of our brilliant uh, 21st century secular thinkers. She's not a Christian. She admits she is very readily attracted to Christianity. As far as I know, she hasn't come to saving faith in Jesus. So maybe we could pray for her. Everybody, let's pray for Louise Perry. Okay? Um, She's brilliant. It'd be good to have her on our side, okay? And it's, of course, it's obviously great for her to become saved and know Jesus. But she can see this too. She's saying we're paganizing. And let me say to you, with relevance to today's facts, we are becoming like Canaan. And so, brothers and sisters, what we need to be is we need to become a just counterculture. We need to have a community. We need to be like the field of Boaz. I would have a quibble with one of the things she said. She says it was about women. Now, generally, it is women that are more often violated. But in the Greco-Roman time, it wasn't even just about women. <laughs> Teenage boys. I, I said this to you. The next time you go to a museum and you see this gorgeous you know, a statue of a young man who's nude, um, I just want to let you know that that is basically ancient Greco-Roman pornography. Because the men back then, they thought of the women as like, well, I have to like, have a wife, and then I'll produce babies for my society because that's, I'm going to be a good Roman. But really, I, I'm really excited about having this concubine who's actually a dude. And I bought him from the slave auction you know, last year because I thought he was really, really attractive. And he might have been 14, or 15, or 16. And that's all utterly normal. So it isn't just girls, it's boys. And today our culture is becoming that way too. And so, in so many different ways, 
the problems cannot just be like, let's elect the right person and then we'll have new laws. You know, we can have lots of laws, but the laws don't solve problems. You know, we, do you know that California is really, really strict, you know, like gun ownership laws? Do you know that? But that doesn't stop criminals from getting guns illegally and doing horrible things in our culture. The laws are not where, just because we have more laws, good laws are good, but what we really need is a new culture. We need a different kind of community. God calls us to not only love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but he calls us to love our neighbors. That includes, Jesus puts it this way too, that when he was asked this question, who's our neighbor, you know what story Jesus told? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. He told all these Israelites who hate Samaritans because they're racist against them, and then he made the hero of the story a person that they hated. So a lot of people think, that's a really great story. We should just be like a good Samaritan. But actually, he's really sticking it to them for their racism, for the ways that they do not practice real justice. So let me say a few things here before we go to the close of my message. Number one, I want to say, first, I want to call a call to the men. Brothers should hear this man, Boaz. See how he acts? We, your pastors and elders, we want every man in Revive to be like Boaz. Every man. We want you all to aspire to be a man of gibor ail, of high worth, of great worth. And that means all our sisters, all our children, even our younger men, they will have protection. They will know that they are loved. And I want to say this other thing too. You know, we live in just an utterly filthy, less filled culture. There's porn, just easily available to your phone. And, and then there are things where there's not, we wouldn't even call it porn, but if you just watch your average TV show, I think it's regularly pornographic, even though all the clothes don't come off. So I don't even like opening up magazines because there's all kinds of certain pictures. I love getting rid of all the commercials when I watch TV now because I don't have to be inflamed with lust from the commercials. So brothers, please fight this in us and don't accept that this is normal. And if you are in company around, around even at work, if you hear the other men like saying bad things about one of the other women, why don't you speak up and say, I don't think that's a good way to talk. <laughs> and then walk away. And they'll be like, whoa. And maybe they won't like you. But God will like you. <laughs> Before God, you will be like Boaz. And you will be like a member of Revive. And I want to say something to our sisters. We need Naomi's. There are women... They need the wisdom of other women. You know, what we need is, there just aren't enough Boazes and Naomis in our culture. We need literally a million more Boazes and a million more Naomis, and that'd just be a good start. So, sisters, please look after each other, and don't be squeamish about saying certain things like, you might not want to dress like that when you go to that party. Maybe that club isn't the best place for you because there's a lot of drunkenness there, and it might not be a safe place for you. Um, lastly, I want to say something to anyone who has maybe experienced the bad end of this. You know, my, um, my wife hasn't, hasn't been violated in this way, but she has a story once where she was sitting, when she was, I think, I think in high school, so high school or college, and she's on the New York City, from New York City, and she, took, she fell asleep with a little nap, and she woke up, and the guy sitting next to her put his hand on her knee. <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> That's in this category. So thankful nothing worse happened to her. But we do know that those things, that's relatively not as bad, but it's still wicked. <laughs> and much worse things happen. And there's a couple things I want to say 
if this has happened to you, especially if you're a sister, certainly boys too. Um, I was actually thinking about all the people that have shared something really painful with me along these lines. I actually have a, I have a dear friend. When he went to college, when he went to college, he was molested by his um, his Episcopalian priest. And what was even crazier is when he told his dad that his dad called the priest. And then the priest said, oh, you know, kids today, they just make this stuff up. And then his dad sided with the priest. That happened to him. So, if, this, if you have been victimized in some way, there's a couple things I want to say to you. One is, please don't think it's your fault. Please, it is not your fault. You did not sin. Somebody else sinned against you. If you're feeling repercussions about this, and sometimes you blame yourself, like, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't have done this or shouldn't have done this. You know, you could do everything just exactly right. And still, it's possible that wickedness can come to you. We could have boys and Naomi's in our, in our lives, but it's not a perfect solution. Wickedness can still happen. So the first thing I want to say is please don't beat yourself up. I was thinking about actually a, a certain number of years ago, um, our family got ripped off through a scam and I lost thousands of dollars. And then I beat myself up over it for the next three years. And that's about money. This is a much more serious business. And so please don't beat yourself up. And the second thing I want to say to you is in our church, we, we, we are here to love you. We'll pray for you. We'll walk with you. We'll weep with you. We have wonderful women in our church who have really great wisdom in counseling and know really good people in counseling. If you even need help for counseling, if you need money for counseling, we will do what it takes to help you. So we beg you. I beg you. I beg you. We beg you. If this is like a pain that's still wounding you, Please have hope that Jesus has a way to bring you to healing. Okay? And I want to say one more thing before I close with something good, because we really, really need good news, which is we're going to have a prayer response time. And I want to just say this. If you're not one of the people that wants to get prayed for on a given Sunday, you should not be looking around the room. Okay? Who's getting looked at? Who's getting prayed for? One of the things that regularly, we regularly offer prayer, so today is not any different than that day, okay? But I want to say this today. Um, don't be nosy. Don't be judgmental. It should be every single Sunday. Do not judge. Do not assume. That, oh, Pastor Seuss talked about this. That's why they're talking. No. On any given Sunday, people come and receive prayer, and sometimes it has nothing directly to do with the sermon. Something else is going on in their life, so do not ever judge, please. It's not your business. But of course, as, as with any Sunday, whatever you need prayer for, we want to love you, okay? And there'll be sisters here too, if you need that. And if you don't want to come forward to, for prayer, no problem. You can come talk to us in private. It might be a very delicate matter, and we respect that, absolutely. We're going to love you in every way, the way that you need. <laughs> okay, let's close. The cleansing blood of the Lamb of God. And you know, we need cleansing when we live in a filth-torn land. And, and maybe if someone has ever touched one of us in a bad way. And I want to close with two beautiful verses. So here we go, 1 John 1, 7. I said this verse during our confession and forgiveness period in our service today, and here's how it goes. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, this is Jesus, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. And here's the part I really want to... There is one who is more worthy. He's actually the son of Boaz. Do you know that? <laughs> I'll get into that later. So he, he is 
We have Boaz, the justice doer. And then we have the ultimate justice fulfiller, the son of Boaz, Jesus. And he did what Boaz could never do. Shed his blood to cleanse us from all sin. So here's the way I want to put this. There's the things that when we think about sin that we want to bring forward to Jesus for cleansing, it's about the things we are guilty of, that we are ashamed of, for which we need cleansing and washing and forgiveness. But today I want to say a special word. If anybody has ever touched you in a bad way, maybe that sin is still oppressing you and hurting you. And what I want to say to you today is, Jesus' blood cleanses you of all sin, including the sin that has been done to you, the ways that you have been harmed, the ways that you have been violated. And it's not a trick. It's not like you come to Jesus and then just boom, you snap a finger and then you'll just be all okay. I hope that that could happen for you. But as you let this unbelievable truth wash over you, that you would trust that the saving blood of Jesus cleansed you of all sin. And you could be emancipated and liberated. You please believe that. And let's close with this verse. Colossians 1, verse 19 and 20. For in Him, that is Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile Himself to all things, whether on earth, or in heaven. So here we go. He will reconcile to himself all things, including now on earth. Here's what it says. On earth and heaven. Jesus says, let your will be done. <laughs> your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And here's what it says. Making peace by the blood of his cross. Will you trust that all your sins and all the sins done to you can be cleansed. All of them. And what you gain instead is an unbelievable peace. A shalom. So your heart can be whole and beautiful for now and forevermore. That is yours in Jesus Christ. And we want to do anything and everything we can as your church family to show you that love and mercy, to help you come to that place of faith and deep healing and peace. Let's pray. Lord, as we live in our modern day Canaan, we confess to you we are not good justice keepers. We regularly fall short of being Naomi and Boaz in our times. But we pray that your spirit wash over us now. And as your spirit washes over us, we would trust in the truth that your blood cleanses us from all sin. And that you will bring, especially those who are vulnerable and hurting, to peace. We thank you that this is the kind of God that you are. And we thank you that you did not leave us with only Boaz. You left us with one greater than Boaz, the ultimate worthy one to take us to an everlasting peace and to reconcile a very wicked and unjust world to yourself. Reconcile your people to yourself. And if there's anybody here today that need your loving kindness. We pray that you would give them hope and a sense of trust they could receive of your love today. In Jesus' name.